There's several things that don't get discussed in the music industry. The hedonism and the partying and the rock and roll behavior and stuff. It feels to me there are some uh, deeper, more underlying reasons for some of that stuff that don't often get discussed. And as an artist, you don't get warned about. You, you don't know who you're speaking to, I didn't. It is the lad off the front of the Arctic Monkeys cover. And he's John McClure's brother, the front man of Reverend, is his brother. No, he's and like my own little PR machine. No, I'm Chris McClure. In 2006, my face was on the front of the fastest selling British debut album of all time. This series is about addiction in the music industry. I myself have had issues with alcohol and six months ago began addressing them. For people of a fragile disposition, the music business can be a very cruel and hard place in which to try and exist. It is a cutthroat industry. The wages are going down, the responsibilities are going up. That in itself is a pressure that you need to cope with. You're just chucked on a roller coaster with loads of free drugs and fags and booze and then one day it chucks you off and then you're supposed to be all right. Episode three focuses on heroin and we'll look at the relationship between addiction and mental health. What's becoming apparent is that the music industry is an extremely tough place to work in. There are common pitfalls that many people fall into. I want to know more about why the music industry, almost compared to other ones, is more prone to addiction. Harry Shapiro is the author of several books on the topic of drugs and popular music. Creative people are often very insecure. They often have very low self-esteem, even when they've made it. And you're taking your fragile self into a very hard-nosed business which takes no prisoners. And it's hardly surprising in those situations that people do find themselves getting into trouble with drugs and alcohol, just as really a coping mechanism apart from anything else. One of the issues with becoming a musician, for example, your, your coping mechanism for life might well have been playing music, writing songs. There's a point in which you're, you're turning that into your career. And it can sometimes flip from being the source of consolation in your life to being the source of the stress. So you have to find other ways, other mechanisms, other things to relax. And if you're lucky, it won't be booze and alcohol, but when there's very little time to do anything else, it'll be drugs, alcohol, smoking. Heroin made its big appearance on the music scene during the 1940s and the 50s amongst uh, American bebop jazz musicians. It was a reaction against discrimination in a way. It was a way of throwing up a wall between you and the rest of the world, which is what heroin does. It just isolates you. You know, it became more of a kind of romantic notion, a misguided romantic notion, as well as ways of coping with all the stresses and strains of the business. I met with Chula Gunnar Wardner. A heroin addiction derailed his band's success during his early 20s. Now a qualified psychotherapist, Chula works with people recovering from drug addiction. I, got, I really loved taking drugs and did everything I could, really, for the experience of it. It didn't become problematic. I kind of thought that trying heroin would be OK. Um, I realise now that was quite an arrogant approach to it. But at the time, you know, I, I, just, I just wanted to have fun, really, and get wasted. What really happened that was the catalyst for the band splitting up was there was one member who wasn't into drugs and they decided that they couldn't take any more of our behaviour. You know, the record company didn't want anything to do with us. Um, the band weren't talking to each other anymore. And um, my dreams have been completely shattered by my addiction. The last four years were horrendous, horrible. And, um, and I became very, very ill. I'd gone down to six and a half stone when I went into rehab. And my doctor said to me, look, if you carry on like this, you're going to get organ failure within a year. All you can think about is scoring, and everything else goes out the window. Um, and by that time, I wasn't really playing music. I was just existing as a heroin addict. Within the industry, did you feel that there was adequate support? There wasn't any support at all. <laughs> I, I would hope that it's better now, and I know that there's charities who are doing some really good work at the moment, but when I was in the band, there wasn't any thought of even talking about it to anyone. So I don't think support existed in any form at all. Um, if it did, we weren't aware of it and nobody stepped forward to offer it to us. Whilst making this episode, I remembered something that Yasmin Benafir had told me back when we were discussing alcohol. She was certain that her experience of addiction was directly linked to her mental health. It stems from your mental health. It's not like you just end up with a problem with alcohol, you know what I mean? There's, yeah. there's something in you that, that needs attention. 
Both Stuart Lane and Adam Fisek are musicians working within the industry to try and improve the support available. Stress and anxiety as mental health issues and depression are now seen as almost epidemic. So it's everywhere in society. I think mental health has gone through a process of change. Um, I think there's more awareness now. I think social media has, has kind of helped that in a sense that it's now more out there, everybody's talking about it. I think addiction is um, something that somebody's used to self-medicate. So they're struggling in some way. So then they've taken a substance or something outside where it's a behavior to enable them to, to survive. I see it as a creative adjustment that they've found to enable themselves to go on with normal life. Well, smoking was really my first drug. I experienced uh, sexual abuse. I was the victim of sexual abuse when I was nine and a half years old and I picked up cigarettes immediately, I think a week after it first happened. And I started drinking alcohol, and it was my first addiction, the cigarettes. It took me away from the pain. The cigarettes stayed with me throughout, and I, um, I only gave up smoking cigarettes in 2015. Um, it was probably the hardest thing to let go of, and probably, if I look at it, really the thing that's done the most damage. I think if the, if the industry, particularly with the young artists, was to prepare them for what's to come. A bit of mentoring, a bit of, you know, just look after them properly, look after them in a way that prepares them for some of the psychological pitfalls. The Levi's are a young band from Derbyshire. The members are aged between 16 and 19. I came to their sold out show in Sheffield to speak to them about their expectations of working within the music industry. I imagine the aim is to try and get a record deal yeah. and do it full time. That's, that's the dream, yeah. What expectations do you have of the music industry in general? Or is it something you've not thought about? Or... What is it like, what it's like? Or like yeah, and or... what you'll be exposed to, how you'd cope with it, I suppose. Is it something that's even crossed your mind? Not really, no. I think at the moment it's, it's like, think about that later on, because like, it happened. It doesn't happen to many people. I, I think. I mean, I, I don't really know much about the music industry, like how, how the record labels and stuff work. I've heard it's all. To do, it's a lot to do with money. People just care about money and getting the songs out and stuff. And I think maybe if it is like that, and the label should care more about the well-being of the musicians because they're the ones who make it, who write the songs for you, aren't they? So. I think it's really important before you do go into the uh, the machine of the industry to work out what it is again that you want from it, what it is that you might perceive might be a problem going through it, or just to be re just to be informed about the journey. Um, because I think there is this, this propulsion and this magnetic draw of the industry, the romantic notion. Um, but everybody will have their own lens from why it's so romantic, why is it you want to make it? We want to play to a thousand people, great, okay, well let's, then we can narrow that down a bit or, or to what that means for you. Um, and I think it's really important from again the work I do with labels to try and sit with some of their artists before they are going a million miles an hour into that journey to work out what, what it means for them, what they actually want from it. Do they know what they're going to be um, experiencing on that journey, both good and bad? If people are armed with tools where they understand, first of all, how, the, how what they think isn't necessarily what's happening, that you can influence and control your own thoughts, that you can build your self-esteem independently of uh, achieving goals that actually are probably not going to achieve those things, then you're, we're far more likely to have a robust group of people entering into the music industry who are going to make better choices for themselves, uh, understand that their health and well-being is a great companion to the kind of career they want to have. In terms of treating addiction and mental health in the music industry, it's very simple in that we need to just start caring for each other and recognising that all of us need support at some time. People under stress to perform with rigorous regimes of touring and the pressures of success. We need to support people to manage that in a more healthy way. And I think we, we, we've chosen to neglect it completely and focus on just the art or the music or the success or the money or the business, whatever it is. And we tend to ignore the person. It's been interesting. I was wary of doing it myself almost and because I knew that I'd have to talk about my problems, whether that be addiction or mental health. But in essence, that's the whole 
that's the root of the issue, isn't it? Uh, trying to get people to open up. I really do hope we can leave behind that sort of rock and roll cliched image. It serves no one now. It almost seems like the perfect medium to promote being open, addressing these issues that go beyond music industry. Going forward, I think especially young people and young musicians can almost like inspire a new generation to be more like community-based thinking, health conscious, uh, and that's probably where the exciting future is really.